Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. And we hope that you are watching with us this morning, looking forward to what God's going to do. Uh, this is a special day for me. Uh, we're celebrating today my fifth year of being a grandparent. Uh, Jude turns five today. And so happy birthday to Jude. And uh, we'll mention some other birthdays later on. Of course, they aren't quite as closely related, though, as Jude is. And that's when we became a grandparent. So that was a blessed day that we still remember and look forward to. Uh, the other two grandsons also are a blessing, but that was the first one. And uh, then it was just uh, continued to be a blessing time and time again. But we are glad to have you with us today, and we hope you'll be encouraged and challenged by the message. Uh, the message this morning is, is one that, um, as I was watching a podcast this week, or actually it was a live stream, I believe, and they mentioned a verse, and I thought, well, that, I'm going to look that up. And it was Second Peter chapter 4, and it talks about trials. And I, I think we're finding now that this this quarantine is becoming a trial to many people, uh, perhaps to you, but uh, we, we, we shouldn't be surprised. And so I'm going to give you four things this morning that Peter gave the church there in the book of 1 Peter, warning them about the trials to come. And uh, the title of the message is Facts About Furnaces. And it's not on heating, it's on the furnace of affliction that we'll find ourselves in the trials that come. But let's bow for prayer, ask God to bless our time together this morning. And uh, one thing too, also I want to encourage you, uh, especially parents, I, I'd really like to get a participation from our children this morning during the object lesson. And so if you can go ahead and uh, log on there to uh, the website or on to the uh, to um, our YouTube account, there's a place right there to the right if you keep the screen small where you can respond. And I'd really, I'm looking, I'm going to ask a question of the children, and I need some responses this morning a little later on in the service. So I'd encourage you there. Of course, you can also put prayer requests in, and we'll get those from Jeff, and we'll go ahead and pray for those requests later on in the service. Let's bow for prayer and ask God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love. We thank you, Lord, even for the challenging times in which we live, that truly, Lord, they would draw us to you. Lord, you know the needs of each person that are listening, uh, that are watching, and we pray that you might just take your word. We take the time we, we worship you in song, and uh, Lord, the, the special opportunity we have that we can't be together physically, but we're together spiritually, and we look forward to that day when we can get together physically. But Lord, until then, help us be faithful and uh, help this service be a blessing as we leave this in your hands. Looking forward to what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is a new month, so we have a new chorus. Got Any Rivers, it's 677 in the hymnal, but I uh, encourage you to sing along. We'll have the words on the screen for you there. Got Any Rivers You Think Are Uncrossable. again since that's our first time and so uh, some of you at home uh, might have never heard this before I think we've sung it before but I encourage you just let's sing that chorus one more time through and then we'll go on to our first hymn found that to be true. It is a blessing to know that God takes care of us and God has a plan and a purpose. And that gives us the foundation for our next congregational song, number 39, Praise Him, Praise Him. We'll sing all three verses and we encourage you at home, sing along with us. And in fact, I have had some folks send me some videos and uh, showing them singing. That's, that's a great thing. That's an encouragement. And so I encourage you, Praise Him, Praise Him.
hope you did praise him with us. And truly what a blessing it is to be able to praise him in joyful song. Zeb is going to come at this time uh, with our scripture reading. I encourage you to take your Bibles. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, Zeb will be reading verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. We'll give you just a couple of seconds here to go ahead and find that and uh, be able to uh, read along with us as we read the word. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the uh, fiery trials which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Of their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteousness scarce, scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Thank you, bless, and then have the Lord bless the reading. We're going to sing uh, two songs together right now, uh, number 678, if you have a hymnal. I know some folks came by and picked up hymnals this week. 678 and then 679 right across the page, Trusting Jesus, and then it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you. 
Jeff, how many do we have signed in from the children? Uh, I don't know. You don't? No one's responded yet. Okay, well, children, here's your opportunity. <laughs> and I'm uh, going to ask a question, and if I don't get a response, I guess I'll ask the few people that are here helping with this. And uh, I'm going to have to ask Jeff and Zeb, I guess, to fill in on this, this question so you guys be ready for this one. Uh, the question, uh, it came to my attention this week that um, I talked with some of our folks, and, uh, and then I talked to my son, who's teaching over in, uh, in Phoenix, that uh, the educators have decided that um, the grade the students had when the pandemic hit and school was suspended, their grade cannot go any lower than that. So therefore, what do you think has happened to most of the young people with their grades? <laughs> and so I was going to ask the, the young people this morning, what is the purpose of school? I was going to say, why do you go to school? But right now, most of you are not, none of you are going to school. Probably you're going to school at home and uh, with your parents. And so, uh, uh, so why do we go to school? Do we have any responses, Jeff? No. None. Uh, I, I'm, I'm hurt, young people, that you would not... You, you of all people know how to log on and how to do this, even though your parents may not know how to do that. Don't forget the 10-second delay. The 10-second delay, okay. So we've got a little delay, so I will, but uh, you know the, the challenge is so many times we think that school is about grades and just getting your grades, but, and, and, or some might think that school is about social things, about going and having a chance to visit. And, uh, but uh, really, school is about learning. It's about growing. Brandon and Vivi, okay, good. What did they say about what's, what's the purpose of school? Uh, says to get educated, and Brandon from Nicholas says to be, be educated. To be educated, okay, <laughs> to get educated. Well, that's good, but you know, sometimes even edu just education itself, you can be very brilliant and, and still have no common sense and, and not know how to live your life. And so we want our young people to understand the importance there that, that education is about growing as a person. It, is, it does involve social. It does involve the physical. It does involve education. But it involves growth. And sometimes, you know, it's like, why do we have tests? I know some of them want to do away with tests. Well, the, the challenge is you're going to have tests throughout life. School, it should be getting you ready for life. Uh, Dr. Bob Sr. used to say that... Um, that Bob Jones, it was not about how to make a living, but how to live. And so we want to make sure that this is what, even as you're going to school, you say, well, I'm going to, to, to a school. They don't teach about Christ. Well, that's not the point. But you can grow in your relationship with him as a result of standing for Christ. And so, young people, thank you for those who participated and logged in. And uh, hopefully we'll look forward to the day not, not too far in the future. Hopefully we can all meet together and uh, we can get your answers again. I miss that time. At this time, uh, Maureen and Megan are going to come and minister to us in a special number.
Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, I will give a few announcements, and we'll have some prayer requests at the end of the service. But I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I said the title of the message is Facts About Furnaces. Now, I'm not an expert on furnace. Actually, though, it's interesting. I, I, did, I used to practice my sermons when I first started preaching when I was in high school. And uh, the church that my dad pastored in Idaho, the best place to get away from everything else was the furnace room. And I'd go downstairs uh, before the service. It was usually an evening service. I'd go down there, and I'd get in there in the furnace room, and I'd practice. My, so I, I do know a little bit about furnaces. I used to practice my messages within the furnace room. But, you know, actually, uh, we all are practicing in the furnace room. And so uh, every Christian who lives a godly life experiences a certain amount of persecution on the job, in school, in the neighborhood, perhaps even in the family, there are people who resist the truth and oppose the gospel of Christ. And no matter what a believer says or does, these people find fault and criticize. Peter dealt with this kind of normal persecution the previous part of his letter, if you want to go back and read the first part of 1 Peter. But in this section, Peter explained about a special kind of persecution, a fiery trial that was about to overtake the entire church. It would not be occasional personal persecution from those around them, but official persecution from those above them. Thus far, Christianity had been tolerated by Rome because it was considered a sect of Judaism, and the Jews were permitted to worship freely. That attitude would change, and the fires of persecution would be ignited, first by Nero and then by the emperors that followed. Peter gives the believers here four instructions to follow in the light of the coming fiery trial. And Zeb read the passage for us there, but you can see that there. And uh, we'll start off in verse 12 here in just a moment. Let's bow for prayer. Ask God to bless our time in the Word together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for Peter and uh, knowing his life testimony and how he had been through the fire. How, Lord, he had denied you, but then, Lord, he becomes a great preacher that can be used of you. And help us, Lord, this morning to take this lesson to heart, to view these trials and uh, other trials that we will go through as part of your process in our lives. And we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We see, first of all, in verse 12, it says there, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Peter says, expect trials. We're going to have to understand there, and he gives us a counsel, don't be surprised. I'm afraid when we get surprised, that's when we don't react like we should. But if we expect these trials, we're prepared for him, these are, there are difficulties that are simply a part of human life. Everyone experiences them. It's part of the human nature that we have trials in our lives. Um, you know, it seems like everything's going along smoothly, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Uh, the printer quits working, or, or your car breaks down, or, or the dishwasher dies, or whatever it may be, trials come along. And that's just part of the human experience. We're going to have trials. But also, there are some the trials that we bring on ourselves because of disobedience and sin. Uh, look back to chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Chapter 2 and verse 18, Peter says this, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thanksworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And then also over, and then it says, For what glory is it, in verse 20, if when ye, uh, when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, that is acceptable with God. Then over to chapter 3 and verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that wherewith, whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. There are times that we have been disobedient and the consequences of sin will come and the sad thing, I, sometimes I wish consequences would come sooner because we have a tendency to think, well, I sinned, there was no problem, I can get away with it. 
but the consequences will always come. Thirdly, it says there, uh, what he mentions here comes because we are faithful to God and stand up for what is right. He means there will be seasons in life when you will lack provision. There will be seasons when you lack power. There will be seasons when you lack position, protection, and a sense of permanence. You know, we would like to have all these things in our lives, and, and we in America have been very fortunate. We have most of them. But there come days when you just you get up and you just feel like this, I don't, I don't have the strength for the day. That's a trial that you have to face. I don't have what I need for today. I don't have what I need. And God has promised to give us what we need, but sometimes we struggle because it doesn't always come right when we want it to. He means at times you will become recipients of verbal and physical persecution that arise on account of the word. And he's talked about that throughout the book of Peter in, in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And then chapter 4, the first few verses here, he talks about this, in fact, uh, as he goes on here. But he means to include the pain that sometimes experienced by those who have loved ones whose bodies appear to be wasting away before their very eyes. I think there's a lot of things that we can handle, but watching a loved one uh, who is no longer what they used to be and uh, watching them waste away, is, it's difficult except for the fact, I think, the assurance that we can have is knowing they're just getting ready to put off that temporary body and get that eternal body because they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what we, we should make sure that every person that we know knows Christ as their Savior. That's why it is essential. But even with these challenges and with the trials, we understand it's going to be difficult. We have all the promises. We have all the assurance. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. But he also talks here as he talks about the dark moments in life when we're asked to fend off the prowling attacks of Satan. A uh, book was written a number of years ago, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. I think it was Hal Lindsey wrote the book. And, and he is definitely alive and well. And he is definitely active. Now don't blame what you do wrong and your punishments on the devil. Uh, you can't be like Flip Wilson, Wilson who said the devil made him do it. But the reality is that the devil is alive, and he is going to be attacking, and there are going to be trials. When you stand strong for the word and for the Lord of God, there are going to be consequences that will come to you. And so he says, first of all, expect it. Number two, he says, don't think it's strange. I don't know about you, but I know that I struggle with God during times of trials. Uh, Sometimes we wonder, where has he gone? Why isn't he around? Why isn't he dealing with us? What's, what's he doing? We wonder, in fact, sometimes if he still cares for us. Uh, we watched the movie the other night, uh, Unbroken. And what an amazing testimony of a man who eventually gave his life totally and completely to God, but to go through uh, a plane crash and, and being at sea for then being in a Japanese prisoner of war camp, and, uh, but what God used him, in, and he, plus he was an Olympic champion, but God used him in a mighty way because he had to trust in God completely. And we had, he got to the end of himself, had absolutely nothing going. And I, 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 would, I would encourage you to turn it over to God quickly and not to struggle with him and be used of God in a mighty way. But you can see, we see here that we feel abandoned in our hour of need. But notice how Peter addresses us here. Notice how he starts this off in verse 12. Beloved. Beloved. And you know, we need to understand, we need to have that kind of a relationship with each other. We need to have that relationship with God, most importantly. But understanding the reality of what God has done here. And he wants the believers to rest in their relationship with God during the trials. As you're going through these trials, you need to trust God. Rest in his care. Know he is there. I mentioned in my uh, emotion of the night how much a blessing abiding radio has been on my phone. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a little secret I found out. It has a sleep timer on it. And so you can set that to play some great, uh, godly, quiet music and it'll automatically go off. And the last few nights I've done that, and I've slept a whole lot better. It's interesting the effect of, of meditating on the right kind of things, on resting in God's care, knowing that God is in control, and being able to see his hand at work in your heart and life. And Peter wants them. You see, here is, I think, one of the basic truths. You can forget everything else, but this one basic truth is this. We need to realize that the fire is a purifying fire, not a consuming one. 
So oftentimes, I think that we f we're afraid we're losing things we need to have. And the reality is that we're really getting rid of things we didn't need at all. And so we see here the importance of this fire. And in the fire, the dross is consumed, the, the waste, the things that we really don't need in our lives that, that God takes out through the fire of burning the dross away. But at the same time that the dross is consumed, the gold and the silver are refined. In fact, turn back to Malachi, if you would. Go to Matthew and just go back a few pages. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi 3, verses 1 through 3. The prophet says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We need to be purified. We need to be cleansed. The dross needs to be burned out of our lives. And if we would give it up, it'd be hope, but we hold on to it so tightly where God just has to bring things into our lives that cause us to finally let go of those things that are hindering the mighty work that he can accomplish in our lives and the lives of those that we come in contact with. Our faith is tested during these times. When the trials come, but yet that trial, that fire that comes, refines us. It reveals in us perhaps the things we don't need, perhaps the things that we do need. I, I, I don't know about you, but I hope that this trial of not being able to meet has refined in you the desire to want to meet together. Um, I think more than anything else is saying, boy, we miss this. I hope you're missing it. If you're not missing it, then give me a call because we've got a problem. And uh, to understand the importance there of meeting together but reveals and it renews us. When the dross, when nothing better than getting a good workout and just feeling like I'm strong, I'm feeling good, and uh, at the end of a trial and seeing how God has brought you through it, and it renews you for the next day and for what God wants to do. Now, many of us have seen pictures of a huge eagle's nest high in the branches of a tree or the crag of a cliff. Few of us have gotten a glimpse inside. I know that I haven't. But when a mother eagle builds her nest, she starts with thorns, broken branches, sharp rocks, and a number of other things that seem entirely unsuitable for the project. But then she lines the nest with a thick padding of wool, feathers, and fur from the animals she has killed, making it soft and comfortable for the eggs. By the time the growing birds reach flying age, the comfort of the nest and the luxury of free meals make them quite reluctant to leave. That's when the mother eagle begins stirring up the nest. With her strong talons, she begins pulling up the thick carpet of fur and feathers, bringing the sharp rocks, thorns, and branches to the surface. As more of the bedding gets plucked up as the fur flies, the nest becomes more uncomfortable for the young eagles. Eventually, this and other urges from the mother prompt the growing eagles to leave their once comfortable abode and move on to more mature behavior. In the same manner, our trials, our thorny situations, our stirred-up circumstances are for the purpose to help us grow up and mature so we will soar closer to the Lord of heaven. As the fur flies, we are to draw near to him. Is the fur flying in your life? And I think that's something to think about, to realize sometimes things are getting stirred up to cause us to move on to become what God wants us to be, to be used of him in a greater way. Then also there's a third thing he tells them here, back to chapter 4 of 1 Peter, that they should not do. In verse 16, it says there, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him not be ashamed. I'm afraid it's too easy for us to be ashamed. I've seen it in high schools where, where kids are, you, they don't stand for Christ because they're ashamed of him. We shouldn't be afraid to identify with Jesus Christ. We shouldn't be afraid to walk the road that Jesus rocked. We are suffering with him. Every time you go through suffering, you're coming alongside and you're, you're experiencing the joy of a relationship with Christ, and he carries you through those difficult times. I guess the best illustration I've ever seen of that is the, is the poem, Footprints. And uh, it shows that uh, people, a person goes through and they see 
in a dream that Jesus, that two sets of footprints going through the sand. And then all of a sudden they noticed that there's only one set and it was a difficult time in their life, but that's when Jesus was carrying them. And he will carry you through those times. He knows exactly what we are able to handle with his power and with his strength. The cause of the trial, we've mentioned this, is to purge, to get out the old stuff, to get out the things that are hindering. I, I see it's been interesting. I've noticed in the neighborhoods many times around us, a lot of folks are doing um, remodeling projects in their homes. We did one in our house. And uh, because they've got time and, and perhaps they're using their stimulus check or whatever else, but, but we're taking care of things that should have been taken care of long ago. And that's great. And we need to do things like that. But the purging that comes through the trial is sad to say probably some of these things would never have been done if we wouldn't have had this time away or this time of, of quarantine. But also purifies. Now, I, I know that there have been other situations too where closeness does not always breed that love that there should be. And being in your household together with the whole family can be difficult. But it, it should purify our relationship. It should produce a greater faith a faith in Lord Jesus Christ. You haven't been able to depend upon your fellow church members. You haven't been able to depend upon your friends, perhaps. But we should be depending upon the Lord Jesus Christ for all of us. You know, Peter told us if we're walking closely with Christ, persecution should come as no surprise. In fact, it's an expected byproduct of our relationship with Christ. The heart of John Wesley expressed that sentiment. Wesley was riding along a road one day when it dawned on him that three whole days had passed in which he had suffered no persecution. Not a brick or an egg had been thrown at him for three days. Now we, we would say, well, that's, is that normal? In, in his day it was. Alarmed, he stopped his horse and exclaimed, Can it be that I have sinned and am backslidden? Slipping from his horse, Wesley went down on his knees and began to intercede with God to show him where, if any, there had been a fault. A rough fellow on the other side of the hedge, hearing the prayer, looked across and recognized the preacher. I'll fix that preacher, he said, picking up a brick and tossing it over at him. It missed its mark and fell harmlessly beside John. Whereupon Wesley leaped to his feet, joyfully exclaiming, Thank God it's all right. I still have his presence. Is your Christian walk strong enough to disturb the world? Is the impact of your testimony making people uncomfortable? The reality of Jesus Christ in our lives should challenge those who don't have Christ. And now I don't think we need to go looking for trouble, but sometimes I'm afraid we avoid it. We do everything we can to keep from having trouble. But, but what God wants to do in our lives is he wants to refine us, to bring us closer to him. So the first thing is expect, and that's the longest point, so we'll go on quickly from here. Number two, enjoy your trials. You say, wait a minute, uh, enjoy my trials? That's exactly what Peter says here in verse 13. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 13, But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. You see, there's some things we receive in trials. First of all, we receive cheer or joy. Look back to chapter 1 and verse 6. Chapter 1 and verse 6, Peter says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. How do we rejoice? We're coming through trials. What do we do? We trust in God. We rest in his care. The second thing we receive is communion or fellowship with the Lord. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. God is working in us. He's bringing us into a closer relationship with him. As I talk with couples, so oftentimes I tell them the secret to having a great relationship is not trying to please each other, it's to please the Lord. And as you're both seeking to please the Lord, that brings you into a closer relationship with each other. And so we see here this, this fellowship that we have with the Lord, that we're suffering with Him. Thirdly, we'll be we will celebrate and be honored with Him. Romans 8, 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also glorif be glorified together. 
And then 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, the joy that Peter is talking about is not going to be right now. It's the joy of knowing what's coming in the future. Uh, one of the things that is mentioned many times as a testimony of joy through sorrow is childbirth. It's a difficult time, but yet the joy is there because of knowing what is coming and the new life that's coming and the joy that comes out of that challenge. And in our lives, there's going to be difficult times, things that are not pleasant, but the end. And the end of all of us is when Jesus comes back and we'll be with him for all eternity. The joy of knowing that we'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we should be looking forward to. In fact, that's the fourth thing. We will be crowned and reign with him. 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. You see, we have to have a long-range view. We have to be able to rejoice because we know what God's doing and what God's getting us ready for. You know, it's, uh, I, I've heard of many, I've heard of this never been part of it, but all these brides that try to fit into their wedding dresses and because they want to look good on their wedding day and they'll, they'll, they'll diet and diet and diet and scrimp and, and try to get a dress that just fits just right and look you know, wonderful for that day. Why, why do they go through all that pain, all that? Because they're looking for that day. And we're looking forward to a wedding day too when Jesus comes for his bride and we have the opportunity to be, to be together with him. So the joy is not because we're enjoying the trial, it's not because we're enjoying what we're having to go through, but rather it's we know what it's doing. It's getting us ready for that day when Jesus comes back and we rejoice together with him. Jewelers have a method of determining the genuineness of a diamond. Uh, they will place it in water. If the diamond is real, it will reflect even greater brilliance. If the diamond is uh, fake, it will dull. The deep, troubled waters of our trials reveal our beauty. We can gripe and grumble or we can rejoice in the Lord. What will you do? I appreciate the ladies saying Ron Hamilton's song, Rejoice in the Lord. And truly, as we are in the midst of our trial, we can rejoice because we know that we'll come forth, Lord willing, as gold. There are some other things we can see here in this, why we can rejoice. We see the pleasure in the expectation. The company for this pleasure is we are always in good company in trials. When you're doing right, you're in good company. Uh, we are with Christ and his church. Of course, the coming for the pleasure, his coming will right everything. You know, uh, I don't know if you've ever had your parents say, your mother say, you just wait till your father gets home. That's not a good thing usually when they say that. But when we say, but Christ is coming, that's a great thing we can look forward to. And his coming, everything's going to be made right, and he will reveal things. You say, well, I'm, I'm trying to do right, and I'm having problems with that. Christ's coming will reveal, and he knows exactly what you're doing. He knows what's going on in your life. We see the court for the pleasure. You see, when he comes, the suffering saint will be vindicated. It will bring joy, joy in the future, but also in the present, in anticipation of good things to come. God has a plan and a purpose. He's working in our hearts and lives. A man visited an orange grove where an irrigation pump had broken down. The season was unusually dry, and some of the trees were beginning to die for lack of water. The man giving the tour then took him to his own orchard, where irrigation was used sparingly. He said, these trees could go without rain for another two weeks. You see, when they were young, I frequently kept water from them. This great hardship caused them to send their roots deeper into the soil in search of moisture. Now mine are the deepest rooted trees in the area. While others are being scorched by the sun, these are finding moisture and strength at a greater depth. May we find strength in being deeply rooted in our faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible also talks, of course, Jesus talks about the parable of the, of the sower. It was actually the parable of the soils where, where the, the seed fell and, and it grew root, but it didn't get depth. And consequently, it died when, when the persecution, the trials came along. How deep is your root? How deeply are you into your faith with Jesus Christ? We need to have that in our lives if we're going to see God bless us. There is pain, however, in the expectation. Notice what he says there. He says, you're going to have reproach. And this is the ideas of verbally and, and the cause of pain. We're reproached for the name of Christ. 
We have this because of our relationship. You said I didn't do anything. I didn't. Well, when you have a relationship with Christ, the devil's not happy with that. He will bring those against you, the cheer and the pain, his promise. When that pain comes, you have a promise we can hold on to. We can rejoice. And it says there, rejoice as you are partakers, and his glory is going to be revealed. We understand the importance here. We have this in our relationship, the cheer. Notice it says there, the consolation in the pain resteth to refresh and to strengthen. And to understand there, you'll be refreshed and strengthened by divine glory and honor. That God wants to do in our lives there, it says, he can't, in the end we have this. The contrast and the pain, of course, the believer will be shamed and mocked in this life, but the wicked will be shamed in the future. So oftentimes our vision is short-sighted. Uh, I can see this today with some folks who are starting to have a difficult time of, of not gathering together, um, even just socially. And uh, the challenge is to understand God has a plan and a purpose for all things. And we have to trust him. And we have to look for the future and understand what God's plan is for the future. Uh, the third thing here we see in verse 15 that Peter wants us to do is not only to expect trials, not only to enjoy them, but to evaluate your trials. Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. He said, make sure that you're not doing one of these five things. Make sure that you don't have sin in your life that God has to deal with. Uh, make sure you're not a murderer. Now you say, well, I haven't killed anybody, but have you wanted to kill someone? Or sometimes people just kill the spirit and enthusiasm of good people with constant unjust criticism. You see, that's just as bad as you say, well, I didn't kill them, but you may have mortally wounded them. You may have hurt them. And, and uh, I've seen this in, in situations where there's four or five people and they're rejoicing, have a good time talking, and one dark cloud comes into the room. And all of a sudden, everything is gone. And we need to understand there, we, we don't, don't need to murder people, don't need to murder their, kill the spirit and the enthusiasm of good people. Encourage them. If you're having a bad day, let them encourage you. Don't you discourage them. And then stealing. You know, you, you may not have robbed a bank, but we steal in other ways. Perhaps you, you take things that don't belong to you or take too many things or perhaps you clock out too soon on your job. That's stealing from your boss. There's all kinds of ways that we can steal. We have to be careful with that, that we're not taking what doesn't belong to us. Sinning, of course, sinning covers all evil. You know, it's a shame when Christians do not act better than unbelievers. You know, we should be different. There should be, people should be able to tell that, that there's something different about us because we're walking a righteous walk that God gives us, how God works in our lives. The last one I found very interesting, and uh, I think this is probably one of the ones that we see a lot in the church even, and, and one of the authors just called it supervising. It's a self-appointed overseer in other men's matters. Now, there are in leadership, there are responsibilities you have, but some people have just taken it upon themselves to set everybody straight. And let them know. And, um, you know, there are many folks that do that. They're busybodies is what it talks about here in this 15th verse. A busybody in other men's matters. You know, there are times we can help. But there's times we can be a burden when we stick our nose where it doesn't belong. And so it's important there to evaluate. And the trials that come into your life may be coming because you're being a busybody. Because you're not letting God work and you're trying to do the job. Trying to do the work. And then fourthly, in verse 19, we are to excel in our trials. It says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Embrace your suffering. It is for your good. Understanding God is at work. He's purifying. He is purging. He is making things clear to you as far as clarity and it's been interesting to see through this trial that we're going through right now uh, things have become far more clear to me for instance what is the most important thing the most important thing is that people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal savior and that they understand the peace and the joy that comes from having that relationship in the midst of trials and challenges entrust your souls in that 
we need to understand that it's not us that are keeping us safe. It is God that keeps us safe. And trust our souls. And it says, fear not him which is able to kill the body, but then also, but him that is able to cast the soul into eternity in hell. Continue doing good. Do right. Dr. Bob used to say, do right till the stars fall. Just do right. And make that your purpose. And you say, as you do this, God's going to bless you. Her name was Lena Sandal. She was Swedish and born in 1832. She loved her father dearly. As she grew older, she often ministered alongside him. When she was only 26, her father died. They were traveling together by ship and were standing together on the deck, reveling in the beauty of the creation. And for some reason, the, sh the ship lurched unsteadily and Lena Sandal's father fell overboard. He drowned before her eyes. The one she cherished was gone. That's when Lena Sandal dug deep within for help and found it. That's when she wrote these words. Day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my father's wise bestowment, I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. How are you doing in your trials today? How are you doing? Are you, are you expecting trials? Are you enjoying them, resting and enjoying them? Are you evaluating your trials and saying, why am I in this? What's going on? And then are you excelling in the trial? Because if we're willing to excel in the trial, we will come forth as gold. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I feel inadequate to express this great passage. But what a blessing to know, Lord, that you are God of, the God of gods and Lord of lords in the midst of trials. You have a plan and a purpose for every trial that comes into our lives. Help us, Lord, to rejoice in it, to expect it. Uh, Lord, help us to be able to evaluate it and help us to rejoice in it. And Lord, to excel in it even. And, and Lord, that truly we would come forth as gold. And we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn this morning, um, we're going to sing the song that I just gave the first verse to that Lena Sandal uh, wrote, and that is Day by Day and With Each Passing Moment, number 144. And we'll sing the, all three verses of that, 144, Day by Day.
a couple of announcements that I want to mention, and uh, then uh, do we have any prayer requests to come in? Okay, and I'll have those prayer requests too. So we have some birthdays this week, not just Jude's, but uh, uh, Shirley Bastotti, she's not getting older, she's just celebrating her birthday on the 4th, and then also Alex Short on the 6th. And so wish those folks happy birthday on those days. And then also today actually is the Sandoval's anniversary. I remember the day. I was there. And uh, so uh, uh, be an encouragement. Let, um, let Francine and Dennis know that uh, you're glad for their anniversary uh, today. And then uh, we do have uh, also our missions giving for the month of April was down a little bit. Encourage you uh, to pray about this. $760 was our missions giving total. And, of course, that is a little below what we need for our missions commitment. We do have some extra funds in there, so it's not that our missionaries aren't getting paid, but we can only continue so long on that basis. So make sure that when you do turn in your missions giving, it is designated, and you can do that through the online giving also. If, you're, if you have any questions about the, the giving, I've had a few folks call me and uh, walked them through some things, even questions about the services, anything like that. If you're having any problems, please give me a call. I tried to call everybody this week uh, that I haven't talked to, and uh, got in touch with them. In fact, we had an answer to prayer. Um, found out this week that um, uh, Vana is out of portable convalescent, and uh, she and Steve are living with his brother for right now, and they're getting their house remodeled. And so they're hoping to move back in the in next week or so. And so that was a blessing. I went by, and I talked to their neighbor, and they told me that, and then Steve called me. And then we have some prayer requests here. We pray for uh, George is having oral surgery tomorrow, and uh, pray for that to go smoothly. Uh, Brian, I haven't heard recently, but the last I heard he was, he was recovering, but continue to pray for him with the challenges he's facing. Uh, Virginia talked to me yesterday about her son, Michael, and he is starting to respond some from his stroke. His stroke was very serious. It was the, in the brain stem, but there's no swelling of the brain, and the brain has stopped its bleed. And so he's starting to respond now. So just continue to pray for Michael and his recovery. Uh, Brittany has an opportunity at work for advancement. Just pray if that's the Lord's will that the Lord would do that for her. And then uh, Tony and, and the, the Hernandezes have been having a hard time with sickness. Rosemary's sick and baby Izzy has a cough and so want to pray for them. But Tony said he's getting better. And I, he's, I said, we need to get you back here. And so pray for that. He's having to work nights, which has been a real challenge uh, there because they want them in stocking in the stores while people are not in them for right now. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for these matters and uh, look forward to what God's going to do. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to bring these requests before you. We pray for George's oral surgery tomorrow that it might go well. There might not be any complications. We continue to... Uh, be with Brian and uh, to uh, help him learn the challenges he faces ahead of him. And then for Michael with his uh, uh, coming back from this stroke that he's been through and for Virginia, she's up there ministering to him that you might strengthen both of them. And then for Brittany, just give your leading and guidance as far as work, this work opportunity that she has. And if it be your will that you would work that all out for her. And we pray for the Hernandezes that we thank you, Tony's getting better. But we pray for Rosemary, she's been sick, and Izzy's got a cough too. And we thank you, Lord, that we can put uh, these folks in your hands. Pray for all of our folks that you might just uh, put a hedge of protection about them. Uh, Lord, we pray for all the DVDs that have been passed out this last couple of weeks, uh, over 600 of them, almost 700 now, Lord, and that you might just use these in homes and uh, guide and direct for folks that we can continue on to pass even more of these out and cover uh, this half of the city. And we look forward to what you're going to be doing in hearts and lives. And Lord, we pray for you might give us wisdom and guidance as far as to when to start meeting. And uh, Lord, just to guide and direct also in all the, all the matters that are going on with this pandemic. And we thank you, Lord, that you are God who's in control. And we know that you have a plan and a purpose for all things. Even these trials that we might come forth as gold. And we'll thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I mentioned in the prayer there... Um, in the days ahead, we, we have met as a ministry council. I've been going and, and I've been meeting with other men around the state uh, online and uh, discussing what we want to do. And uh, the, the governor has said he doesn't want churches to start meeting until August when the nail parlors open. But I'm sorry. I think we're more essential than nail parlor, even though right now uh, the, uh, the pot stores, they're, they're essential and a few other things. And so uh, we feel as a church that we're, we're essential. And I know, I don't know about you, but I know I, I, I love seeing these posters and out here. And, and they'll be here when you come back because we're going to use those as spacers. 
But uh, I'll be sending out a letter this week. It'll be, actually it'll be an email. And then for those that don't get email, I'll send out a letter on our plan for coming back together. It will not be the same as it was. We, because of this, there are some things we're going to have to do. And uh, it goes against my very grain to tell people they shouldn't come to church. But we're going to have to do that at first as we get started back up. But I'll have that all explained and uh, get that out to you this week. So pray for that and pray for the Lord's leading. And we thank you for watching, and uh, we'll have the service tonight. We'll be uh, just an audio recording, as we encourage you. We're going on to, in the book of John, John chapter 11 comes to one of Christ's greatest miracles, raising Lazarus from the dead, and I hope that it'll be an encouragement to you. Thank you.